is, is just yeah. timely yeah. communication. Yes. Yeah. You, you can't just push we'll call it to the order. The, the city side. council work session for City Beach Grand Forks for Tuesday, November fourteenth, twenty twenty one, is now five o'clock. Would the city clerk please call roll? Here. Council President Here. Council Vice President Here. Council Members Clarence Here. Dale Helm. Here. Tim Johnson. Here. Mark Demers. Present. Brian Larson. Here. Does term corn number one request to start promotional and hiring process? Chief Bushy. Thank you, Mr. President, Council. Uh, one of my assistant fire chiefs just informed me that he's going to retire at the end of March. So, what I'm doing is requesting that you would authorize uh, civil service to start the internal promotional process for assistant chief and engineer, and then uh, authorize a process for hiring a new firefighter. And with this starting in January, January 1st. Do we have any questions? Mr. Demers. Is, um, is the assistant chief position, is that in the bargaining unit? Yes. Okay, that's fine. Yep. That's all I want to know. Thank you. Anybody else have anything? See you none, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Number two, request for approval to addendum three to the Special Operations Group Joint Powers Agreement, Chief Edlin. This is just bringing back before you a, just a slight alteration to the existing joint powers agreement for our special operations group. Uh, looking to add on Grand Forks Fire Department, they're only going to be part of one team. Uh, basically, it's all one Do you have any questions for Chief? See none, sir. Appreciate it. Thanks. Number three, review of proposed 2022 budget. Ms. Anderson. Thank you. I'm not used to being up so high up on the list. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I, I just mail. I, excuse me. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I updated. Um, I sent out to all of you. I don't know if you've seen it or not. Um, I email on where we're at now with the budget. If you did not get the email, I'm, I'm pretty sure Megan. Gave them to everybody. So we're at 457, 456 of expenses over revenues with the 5% levy. And um, what I said in the email is those are changes due to uh, pretty much personnel. There was $9,600 uh, drug force task is going to <coughs> contribute to the city of East Grand Forks for um, a little more of administrative assistance we're going to give for the drug task force. So they're going to pitch in $9,600. The other changes are is that we're looking at filling administrative assistant position at the police station at 50 or 75 percent. And so we have savings there. And then we also looked at where we're at with personnel. And since September, we have had person employees that have changed probably from like family to single or some that have waived their insurance because their spouse has it or such and that's where those savings are from <coughs> so I guess at this point I I would entertain suggestions or questions that the group may have or David please yeah, and I guess um before we get that, uh, um, so we're, with uh, those recent uh, changes, we're, you know, as Carla said, we're down to 457. Um, I just want to take note of that. Um, I think it's on page 17 of your packet. Um, so of that 457,000, um, 273,000 of it is from the uh, personnel, um, which again are run by union that by the contracts um, I will say that I think we are in a better position here for 2022 than a lot of other cities do the fact that we had a longer term contract um, and we did get them in at a I'd say a favorable rate um, with uh, what the CPI is doing is uh, other cities are not um, do not have that same amount uh, so there's 273 there we had a change in attorney's fees of a hundred thousand and the transit increase of 110 which most likely will disappear so of that 457,000 really um, more than 473 are just those three items alone so um, makes it a little bit um, 
difficult for some of the adjustments just because those three are you know fairly set so but we'll take what any questions the, you said of the 457,473 is actually 483 uh, are uh, 483 of an increase are those three items but on the uh, on that same page we had had some savings over the time there as well so we had a 239,000 decrease in in what savings up there so we had increases in savings so it, it washes out to that 500 so probably up to 50 percent anything else sir nope that's it anybody have any questions in I'm sure Mr. Demers I know you want to ask questions. Wow, well, why not? <laughs> you know, so uh, I do have a couple questions. So in the admin finance tab, it looks like we've got about a hundred thousand dollar increase to the city attorney. Is that? Yep. So is that due to what perceived? Increases in work for property acquisition. Those no, actually, I'll, 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 I can address that, and then uh, if Ron wants to add anything to it, he can. Uh, majority of this came from what our actual costs were. There's a couple things that have changed um, over the over these last, I'd say, two years. One was we renegotiated the city attorney's contract, um, which made some changes. Particularly, um, more they affected probably the police department more. Um, as far as uh, for the prosecutions and uh, previously he was getting a flat rate uh, for that we went to a more of a per hour rate for a host of reasons um, and so with the what the city attorney has been used for uh, over the last several years um, even with that change uh, we had been under budgeting for that uh, we the, our actual expenses have been higher than what they were so um, th so it's a combination of one it's the changes in the um, in the contract and number two we're looking at putting it in and more reflective of what our actual costs truly are so. because like in 19 and 20 it shows actuals of 187 and 205 which are above the 187 we had budgeted last year but not 287 mm -hmm. no I agree go ahead I can I can kind of address <coughs> some of that too. And I don't, I'm not trying to attack. I'm no, just no, I, I, I have, I'm just uh, so that you have the information. Yep. Uh, some of that is my contract, and some of it is is utilizing Kennedy and Graven and those types of things. It all gets lumped into attorney's fees. Uh, the other thing of it is, is since COVID, we've been doing five days a week for criminal law, where I was only doing two days a week, potentially at the most before. Um, so I would say that a a lot of it is just due to the fact that the court system is being functioning because they are behind in the uh, uh, processing of criminal uh, files. What they've done uh, previously before, I was, I was primarily doing just Wednesdays and then maybe another day a week. Right now we're doing in custodies on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. They've got me doing Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday uh, Zoom court uh, most days. Um, the other thing of it is, uh, Mr. Demers, is they've got uh, they're trying to uh, get the backlog uh, reduced from when they uh, weren't able to have trials. Uh, they've just recently, uh, the state of Minnesota has uh, uh, granted some additional funding for senior judges to try to, uh, you know, again, it's going to probably increase some of the, the time that we're there, but to get rid of the backlog. Uh, prior to COVID or prior to this process, um, I probably had somewhere in the line of maybe 100 uh, open files at the most at any time on a weekly basis. Now I've almost doubled that to almost 200 files. And then, for instance, tomorrow in court, I'm actually handling <coughs> about 65 to 70 files just tomorrow. So a lot of it is because of the, uh, because of the increase in COVID. I can see that that potentially will be reduced significantly once we uh, resolve those issues. Okay. So just so I get what the problem is, is it 
an increase of crime or just an inability for the system to process it due to regulations of who can get into the courts and all those type of things? I think more than anything, it's it has been the inability to process the files due to the due to the restrictions on the court, um, and I haven't really tracked the if there's yeah. been an increase in crime. Uh, Chief might be able right. to have a better, but cases? from from my standpoint, most of it would be because of the backlog of cases because they shut down the court. They didn't have trials. Right. They didn't have those types of so things. and. To that, you kind of started to answer my next question by saying it should diminish, or at least at some point we'd hope that it gets back to a more close, closer to the mean or the norm. I would at some point, who knows when that's going to be? I would have a, my next question. Maybe is for for Ms. Anderson. Is that then, since this is a COVID-related thing, is that something that we could apply ARPA dollars to, or? you know, any COVID relief type dollars too. So if you look at the ARPA dollars, there's those four sections again. And um, one of them has to do with increases to online, pe to frontline people. The other increases is to like mitigation. Another one has to do with, I'm trying to think. And really the only box what we can use the ARPA dollars for is for infrastructure to water, stormwater and sewer, not streets, just those. And you know, and then the loss we have from 19 to 20, 2019 to 2020, those are dollars that we can use for specific projects, and they are not as limited as those four boxes. I just I so if that was a choice. We, we could decide on that. Um, we've gotten half the money now, which is like 496. We got, um, for example, we got 24,000 from state aids maintenance because they had extra dollars left over, but we had to use that specifically for a project. Mm -hmm. So we're using that for the mill and overlay flood project at River Road because we have to pay 25% because it's a state emergency expense. It wasn't a, a federal disaster so we use that for that project so we have to specifically use it for projects or specific items right I just want I mean I think we should even if we can't apply ARPA or if we have any I don't think we have any whatever uh, the CARES uh, dollars, CARES had, dollars. To be, they had to be spent by November of right 30th of 2020 I just think it's something we should even if we can't budget or account for it now this is clearly something that's COVID related that we should talk to our legislators about they're going to be working with lots of dollars coming through we should at least put a pin in this and ask for some relief on that thank you for that I know I know the city of Crooks is having the same issue right and I I've like I said I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what the hundred thousand was for and yeah it it makes sense um, it just it's odd I mean that they hadn't had the foresight because I know there's been talk of how you know how to put new money into the court system because of some of these backlogs but at some level it needs to come all the way back to cities and other jurisdictions that are having to yeah you and know, you know that it's uh, dealing with it because the state is actually designating to the court system senior judge money to be able to try to get rid of the backlog and this is the second time that they've done it right. and hopefully that it'll be the last um, that we can get caught up but it's it's uh, too early to tell um, I believe that the senior judges are going to be in place until uh, end of June uh, is when they've uh, established it. They've also established a second kind of a referee system that they've designated money for to take care of, um, like, say, restraining orders and those types of things that were normally done by the judges as well. Um, so that's where the, the funding seems to be going at this point. Thank you. I appreciate the information. Um, in the Council and Commission's budgets, Notice that the mayor is getting an extra five thousand dollars to spend. Yep, and that was on the list here. Um, so every year the mayor does the state of the city. So 
don't mean to pick on you. Oh, it's good. a good event, but um, <laughs> yes, it, you know, it does cost money for us to put that on. Megan does a wonderful job putting that all together. Um, this year, one of our added costs was um, HP and sound um, and some other, other of the technical um, items were done by an outside contractor. So that was main main increase on that. Isn't that correct, Megan? Okay. Mm -hmm. But I just listed it because it was one of the changes. Sure. This may also be a case of there's been some expense year after year and finally we're capturing it and showing it, right? So it's good. I think it's appropriate and uh, and that's an event that we do. So when did we start with H, like last year? Yep. Or was that, no, because the year before we used water and light. Yes. Yeah, so we, was we it did the virtual one with them in the first of COVID, and then we did the next one with them last year. Yeah. So I, the reason I increased it because I saw what we spent this year. Right. And it was over budget because we didn't budget for them in there. So now I have to budget in for next year, so we won't go over. So how, how much, much were we over, Carla? That five. Really? 5,500. Does that, that include line. the amount of water and light put in? No, but that goes into revenues. We can't, we, you know, we have to keep revenue and expenses separately. Mm -hmm. So the revenue came into another account and the expenses came out of yeah. here. So, so water and light picked up a part of that. So the three thousand, water and light, I believe, gave $3,000. Of the five something. Yeah. Because historically they had done it in kind with staff time and, and tech time. And so it was almost a wash on that part of it for the savings they had of their, their people time and the, and the technology and everything. So it wasn't an incremental cost of that five. It um, roughly the three was already being done by water and light. Yep. Okay. And then obviously the next one I've got is library. We've got four FTEs currently. There's three. Um, you know we've had discussion in the past about what the needs are. Currently there's an unfilled position. Um, I think it should be up for council discussion you know how we want to fill that position if we want to fill that position um, I mean it's currently in the budget right now at a grade 17 I believe can, can I make sure that's the right amount because I know sure. the FTEs we, we just I just got a better look at them today and Charlotte can answer that better on how many as far as full-time people, yes, there's three full-time people and one that's vacant, and we do have uh, six part-time people. So in the three, though, are you included in the three? Uh, uh, yes. Okay, so then, I'm sorry, but I, this is off, so there's only one in three. Instead of... And there's one. Administration yeah. is one. one there. Right. And there's two. And there's there's one open and one filled in circulation. Okay. And then there's programming that would be. So there's support. three budgeted positions. There's two that are filled other than yours. Mm -hmm. That's correct. OK. So the, right it now, the, the budget is for four full-time equivalents. There's currently yep. three full-time filled. filled positions. Like I said, and we've talked just recently mm -hmm. <laughs> um, about this. And actually, it's been a conversation going back couple years uh, right. about how we want to proceed with this if it's the correct position if it's if we need an initial person if we need additional two people if we need it at a 17 um, I guess my perspective is that number one I think that we should have I don't mind filling position in this spot I don't think it should be a level 17 type position um, I think we should shoot for I guess I'd have to go back on my my grades but I I think we could have a more broad discussion if we want to have one just on that position but I think it should we should look at something that doesn't require or recommend you know degrees or advanced degrees um, for that position that's first part second thing I'll say is currently we have three full-time librarians at our is that correct three like people with library degrees two with library degrees two, okay we currently have two librarians at 
in our things. At Northland, there's two. At the city of, or at the school district, there's one. I, I don't see, and I hear from people that why should we have additional staff beyond what those those institutions that education libraries are at the core of their mission where I would say this is my my words not anybody else's but that library and education are not the principal um, mission of the city you know I I've said it before I don't think it is I, um, so that's kind of my layout for that I would say that we should either on the extreme side reduce that to a three FTE somewhere probably more negotiable find someone find a position that is you know closer to 13 or 12 I'd, I'd have to see what those do but I without the the education requirements um, maybe being more considered considered of what those job tasks would include so that's my library rant up for discussion a yield timer Charlotte so in the 2022 budget it is a grade 17 that is budgeted for that the library board has talked about that grade numerous times and we've done the work to repoint it at grade 16 and at grade 14 approximately every grade is about five thousand dollars in salary we don't have anyone, any position right now that requires a library degree. We are fortunate to have two librarians with that degree in the library right now, which is a, it's a wonderful thing. So to fill a fourth position to pick up the things that we hope will return once the pandemic has settled out um, and the community gets back to normal, the board has talked about having plan B and C knowing that we might have a different grade level and that's fine um, we can we can work with that and we have to determine if we're all going back to normal after the pandemic and exactly where we'll be um, as far as Mr. Demers comment about where the schools are this each school is very focused on an age group public libraries are focused on all age groups that's the biggest difference but we've also had conversations about how much we do for the schools we keep in conversation we have a regular i have a regular conversation with mr colness and with northland about the services that they're providing everything from tutoring to proctoring and for us going into the school systems we can't fill their vacancies that's something they have to do in their budget we will support the schools but we can't be their librarians in the school and we are aware of that I have a question Charlotte if I may um, so is this position like the assistant librarian are they the lead are they a lead person at a grade 17 they would have been an assistant to me that would be the the second of the four full-time people if we go down to a 14 um, grade level it it will be a group effort whichever one of us is there at any particular time is the one that will take the lead so I will be the supervisor and the other three are the ones that are keeping it running so if you're gone it's a group effort yep okay I'm just asking because I know other positions other you know we have the fire assistant we have lead in park we have in public work so I just want to make sure I was aware of that also so thank you Charlotte um, if I could Charlotte um, you and I have had this conversation verbally but also in some emails would you please um, tell us the kinds of things you want to bring back um, the media pick up on our council meetings and, and even for all of us to know okay this position opens the door to bring back these several things that are, are high value to our community would you please for, for all of our sakes kind of touch on some of those again sure the priority right now would be getting our volunteers back. Uh, 
to have a volunteer in the library, they have a background check and they get training and they're scheduled. We need somebody to help us coordinate that. We don't, we aren't doing any proctoring right now, which hopefully the schools are picking up more of that. We're not doing any tutoring, which is all volunteer based. We train them, we get them set up, we recruit them, but the tutors are the ones that do that. We've had a lot of requests, again, from the schools and from parents. Um, we do do outreach other than the schools. We had a pop-up library at Good Sam's. We haven't been able to do that. We read over at Edgewood Vista, which we've been trying to get back over there. Those kinds of things are the really big things right now that are hanging out there. The newsletter is, is being picked up and shared amongst us, those kinds of things that we work very hard to get done in, in the hours that we have. Any organization that is built to, to empower volunteers and, and facilitate the programming of volunteers, that's, that's money well spent. You know, to the staff hours, and then you can multiply that by five or ten when you bring the volunteers in to the good that's being done off of that one staff person. So I think that's, that's a good thing. Pre-pandemic, our volunteer hours added up to the equivalent of at least one FTE, if not one and a half. Good. Which saves a fair amount of money. Good night. So uh, we talked, you used to have a position that was just a volunteer coordinator. Right. Do you know what that was pointed at? I don't think it's on this list or whatever. That had changed over time. It started at 16, and I believe we moved it to 14 when it went down to 26 hours. It had been a full-time position, and it went to 26 hours when the program coordinator became full-time. Then when we hired a public service librarian, we no longer had a volunteer coordinator or an administrative aide. So we've tried to keep the balance and the numbers down. So if you went down to a, I'm just asking the question, yep. I'm not saying this is what I'm for, I'm just clarity. If you went down to 14, would that person be able to do what you need to do or would you need to hire another part-time person? I'm just trying to understand if you no, went to 14. No, I think that's a really good question. And I'll, right now I would say it would depend upon who's filling that position. Um, right, exactly. Um, it's, it's possible with the part-time people we have right now that we wouldn't have to hire another one, but we are working with three students, so every semester the schedule changes. So that's, that might be, it might be where we need to hire one more person in the summer because we're doing, you know, summer programs five days a week. So I'm wondering if you went to 14 and had to hire a part-time, would you be back up to the 17 costs? That's what I'm getting at. No. Would you, would you be up to the That'd be a 15? Yeah. Health insurance. No, it wouldn't make up the difference there. But if you had a part-time person, it's only their salaries. There's, they're not getting any benefits, so right. it doesn't right. make a difference whether 14 or 17 on benefits. No. We have excellent part-timers right now. So you've had a hard time filling those, too. We've had a really hard time. Like every other department. <laughs> right. Well, or any other business. Yeah. You know? yeah. And, and think, our departments also. And I think Charlotte really, you know, put her finger on one thing that we're, I think every department is kind of working through is, you know, and I said this today is, you know, we can't just go back to 2019 and say that that's the start point. Like, we almost are still waiting to find out where our baseline is going forward, what our what's the new norm or what's the new reality and kind of what I've expressed to her is you know my one of my reservations is as we get into this new norm like are we going to have the right model going forward are we going to have the flexibility to make that model going forward and like like I said I'm not a, I don't want to go to that three I think that's a drastic thing to you know move down to three people I, I don't think that's the right thing but I want to make sure that we're at least in a position that is flexible enough that we can 
adapt to whatever 2023 20, and four and five is going to get us. So I, I guess I don't know if if we can make a decision right now, but I would say, you know, if this gives, if we could give direction to the library board, you know, a, a you know, something like a 14 or for 15 or whatever that number is, I think if the vol if that volunteer coordinator could be a 14, like you can maybe increase that volunteer participation, like we've talked before. And part of my thing is I always feel like people rise to their expectations and that we, you know, if we can find the right person, like this person could, you know, enhance their position multiple times by increasing that volunteer base. Um, but then again, maybe we're in a position where people don't want to volunteer anymore. You know, who knows? Uh, we don't know that. And so I guess my thinking is, is if we could give the library board a kind of a, a general direction of like a 14 position put that number in our budget whatever that would be I don't know what the difference between the two would be but by next week we could have that adjustment into our budget I think I'd be fine with that I don't know if anybody else has any reservations on that I think no. if, excuse me if that's the case I think we could also give them the go-ahead to, to start the process How would we feel about that, filling the position? That would it would be great for us. Yes, I'd be on Start board with that for 2022. Yep. Yep. I want the 14. Step 14. Do you have a question, sir? Yeah. Um, a couple of things that. uses that place a lot. The other thing that I know she doesn't want to say, but I'm going to say it, there's no reason that she should have to put in 60, 70 hours a week, which is what she's doing. No reason she should have to do that. No other department head is doing that, I'll guarantee you. That's why we need to have this step 17 so we can have somebody there that can run the pill and take care of things so she can get back to her normal life too. That's the big problem. Would just, I mean, she can hire all kinds of part-time people, but the library isn't going to run as efficient or anything if you do that. I mean, uh, and, and the only other option is uh, you, 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 you know, close it down two days a week or three days a week. That's no good either, because people people come to that place uh, all day long. So that's the thing we're really missing here is, is the hours that she's putting in right now because she doesn't have the help that she needs. And that's very important because uh, two things are going to happen. You know, uh, she's going to burn out, uh, and and if she leaves, if she was decided to leave or something, it, it's just going to deteriorate. Our library, we have something to be proud of there. That's a very good one. Uh, they do. I think if you go online in the library right now, they got all kinds of different programs going on over there to do. Uh, so, and I think to me the most important part is. The hours that she's putting in, she should not have to do. So, when you advertise this position, do you not advertise a range, or do you advertise exact at seventeen? It's do you not? Do you? Would you not advertise it as a range on that? It's it's the range of grade seventeen. So it's only on the seventeen. Right. So. So step one is 17 right, right. through. I understand yeah. that. If we did bring someone in at a 14, Charlotte, with the other people that you have, so now you have one more full-time person, um, could you reallocate the workload such that you could get your, your sanity back and, and confine your time closer to that 40? Well, I think all department heads know 40 is ideal, but not very you know, routine. Um, I, I appreciate that the board recognizes the hours that we're putting in. And 
the board has been very supportive of wanting to get a professional in that position, um, and that is what they have backed all the way along. Um, I I know people can be trained. I know we can find someone to fill that position. And if you advertise and you get people in there who apply who cannot do it, we don't hire them. It's not an easy process to hire. I, I think the other thing sometimes miss that if she does get the ideal person and they're out of 14 and they're doing work of a 17, they, they can ask to be reappointed. And I don't know what the whole process on that, David, is, but isn't there a way to do that, you know, especially if they're in a union, that if they're doing work out of their class, that they can come back. Their job description. Yeah, they, they, would, they would file a, a request for a yeah. report. So, you know, so we hire somebody at a 14, but they're really doing the work of a 17. Somewhere down the line, they could say, they could file a grievance. So. Right, but I think what we would do is, I mean, we would try to go through the process of, You'd almost have to reverse engineer it with whether it's Kennedy and Graven or whomever to kind of build back the, you know, kind of find the happy medium between what they're trying to do and try to find one that's going to point out. We're going to point it before we we have it. We're not going to say it's something is not what it is before. So we the go. job we, description whatever, would yeah, reflect the point. Job, job, job description yeah, before the job description would reflect the point and have it point where it is. Yeah, absolutely. So. It may might take a couple drafts to get to where everybody wants to be, but I don't think. Did you want to speak to me? I'm a, I'm Renee. You have to come I up think. to the mic. Yeah. Sorry. So I'm Renee Maybe, and I know that you got an email today from me and from Marty Vanderpan, and thank you very much for reading our email and considering the comments that we made. I'm here, and Marty is at another meeting. She may join us later. Um, we're just very much in support of the request that the library has made to move forward with the 17. I will tell you that the process that the board has gone through, that Charlotte has gone through in terms of investigating this position, involve conversations at the state level, involve conversations with the resources that Charlotte has relative to what does this job description look like, what does it entail, what person can come in and hit the ground running. I will tell you that I investigated a lot of salary structures on OSHA, that when you go in there I learned a lot because you can look at a public services librarian and you can look at salaries and expectations at the national level, at the state level, at the northwest Minnesota level, and it breaks it down. And the issues with the public service librarian for the credentials and for the job description and for the salary, the 16 and the 17 are on board. We had spent a lot of time talking with Carla. I think also Charlotte had talked with Carla about you know what kind of things, what it looks like at a 14, what it looks like at a 16, what it looks like at a 17. And the board came away with the 14 was certainly the least desirable level because it doesn't allow the person to hit the ground running because having a library degree does, we like to think, certainly there can be, people at all levels of employment that are very capable and some that are not very capable, but that um, a lot of other professionals require certifications and degrees and licenses and board examinations and credentials to assure that they can do the job well and efficiently. And certainly some of the tasks that came out of the previous positions that have been eliminated wouldn't have required the library degree, but some of them that we are hoping to hire for will do better with the library degree. Um, and so the board talked about 16 or 17 as being the board's preference. And I will be glad to address any questions. and. You know, I'm going to sidebar on a personal note here. My support for the library is because I'm on the board and I see what they do and I've used libraries all my life and I know what a difference it has made for me personally and professionally. But that doesn't mean that I'm here to discount any of the other work that the city does. I like my nose cleaned off and I like the clean water and I like the 
the sewer systems that work and I like the park that's within walking distance of my house. And I just wanted to say thank you for all those things that I probably haven't said thank you for. But I also am here on behalf of um, the board and would hope that you would consider the full job description as you move forward. Um, do you have any questions? I'll go back to my question again of how we advertise this. And that's why I'm bringing up the question. Can you advertise it with the pay scales? Or do you have to actually advertise it? Can you not have a range in there? I think, really? may, I ask, may I ask a question of you before this goes forward? Sure. Would that be OK? Um, if the 14 didn't require the diaper degree, that makes a huge difference in how you would advertise it and how your salary structure would look and who you would get applying for the job. To be honest with you, I'm not even looking at the 14 personally. So okay. that's, um, but, so let's say we did, you wanted to hire somebody and you had 16 and 17. Could you advertise it from the 16, one to 17, whatever range? Or are we bound by having to advertise it at a certain dollar amount? Uh, well, you could, I guess the way to the way to answer that is um, the how the position we would need to advertise based on the on the position description and what pay scale that position description fits into our pay rate. You know, as far as what grade that would be, um, I think it would. I, I really don't know how we would advertise a position that's graded 17 with a range of 16, um, depending on like what kind of a, uh, applicant we got. So uh, we would have to advertise um, at the pay scale for the pay range of the, the pay rate that it's at, uh, the pay grade that it's at. Um, and, and looking at this, I mean, I, I think um, what the, the council would, in my recommendation, would, would need to consider here is yeah, looking at what um, really what the need of the library is, what type of service they would be providing, and then go with the position that would require that because, um, you know, and then advertising for that. Because um, if we would go to a 14, um, I, I, I'll just say this is just a personal side and I'll, I'll just make my recommendation. It's, um, in my experience, it's bad policy to to try to write a position for a grade, it's better to look at what the need is in that particular department and then grade it from there um, and try to see where it, where it fits in in that. But um, it's in, just in my experience, it has not out, turned out well when we've tried to write a position for a grade. Okay. What costs are incurred when we have to go back and grade it? How much attorney fees do we have to pay? Oh, it wouldn't be attorney's fees. That oh, would go, yeah, that would, it, 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 we would go to the, yeah, whatever. Yeah, um, I think we use Baker the, Tilly. Yeah, Baker Tilly. So we use their, um, for, if you're going to regrade it, um, probably, I'd say maybe $1,500, 2000 depending what it would be. And I think some I mean, of that has would, been done, hasn't it, Charlotte, or not? We have had, uh, yeah, points are regraded twice. We have two different suggestions that came from David Drown Associates. Oh, okay. But they haven't gone to civil service yet, so that would be the next step. So I think what she's saying is that you can look at what's already been done and look at those and what they're pointing at now. Don't don't you believe yep. that? So it wouldn't it wouldn't be an additional cost to look at what the grades are because they've already been done and paid for. So it would be a matter of what that job description is. You're not helping my point because I was going down the road. If it's going to cost us money to repoint something, well, we're adding costs back already. We're trying to save money. So. Well, no, you, no you, they've already been done. So we don't have to. We have that cost. Yep. We don't have but, that cost. But, <laughs> but if you would have to, I, I, I see what you're saying. But if, if they would be making any changes, yeah, but to any kind of substantive change, yeah, you would have to have it repointed. And repointing, I mean, granted, um, I'm not trying to help your cause or hurt your cause here either, but but repointing it is a lot. Like if you made a like a, a if you make a small change, like a couple of um, job uh, job duty changes to a, pos a position description, it's less costly to have that re looked at than it is to have a whole new one looked at. Do you have something? Yeah, I would just add my perspective. Um, I think we should move past this impasse, fill this position. Um, to my ears, it sounds like 16 is somewhere in between. Um, certainly 14 is, is not the right 
um, job category. And if the board is interested in 16 or 17, I would I'd be in favor of uh, budgeting for a 16 and then moving forward to fill the position at that level. Thank you. Bill Seminy input. Mr. Vetter. Uh, I'm still stuck on FTEs. So your full-time equivalents, are you including all the part-time people in there too? No, we only put full-time equivalents in there. So, so they probably have seven actually full-time equivalents in there then? No, you said that you had one extra for volunteers, right? We, uh, not counting volunteer hours, it's it's about 6.4, 6.3 if Total they fill FTEs all their then. hours with part-time people, yep. So then in all the departments, then we haven't included any of the part-time. No, no, because like with parks, we, you know, we hire... 75 oh. people and understuff. Uh, yeah, so you know, we just, yeah, just, just it's something we can't keep up with. When you're telling me you have four time, full, four full time equivalents, you actually have more than that. Now, I would like to see the actuals then with all part times included in here because then it makes a difference in how I look at the budget also. So, and on, on those, those documents, it's full time employee positions, is what that is. On every department. It's not equivalence then. No. Part-time or excluded. Yeah, and I know when we fill out the forms with the state, they just say full-time employees. It's not even, they don't ask for equivalent. You know, we put the, the, the state budgets and stuff, but for yes. For my information and looking at budgets, I want to know full-time <laughs> equivalence. Okay, department heads, I get to get work. That. And it's, you kind of need both, right? Because the mm -hmm. full-time positions... You need to know how much they're getting in benefits and all those types of things. Right. I mean, they, I mean, they could be said, yeah, we haven't increased. We've had four, four full-time equivalents for the last four years, but we've gone from four part-times to nine part-time people. Right. Well, I guess the other thing is, is that you know, and Charlotte could say that, but when you know, if the hours are open, how many full-time employees need to be on staff? At least one, or do you have like At least those? one? Okay. So. I think that's the bigger issue when she looks at hours and stuff. She has to make sure she has full-time employees with the part-time employees. And I think that's the same thing with a lot of other departments, too. I know, like, at the rinks, right? Reed, there's always a full-time, usually a full-time employee at the rinks when the part-timers are there or some? No. Okay. Mr. Johnson. Yes, I heard Charlotte say that uh, when they do volunteers, they need a background check. Is that correct? If, if they're working with children or youth, yes, they have to have a background check. Okay, when I was in the, uh, when I got drafted in the military, it cost the, it cost the government $10,000 for my background check. What does it cost for yours? I believe that it has gone up to 40. It was 35. What kind of a person. background check can you get for $35? Good. I think Mike could answer that. <laughs> We're not allowed to do them for other employees. Or Police Department our access to records is very limited for anything in the criminal justice information system. We're not allowed to access that to do that for other city employees or other city departments. Uh, so that has to be done through uh, different private organizations, which is the fee that, that Charlotte's referring to. So if we could do it, we could do it at cost, but we're not allowed to by state statute. And, and that we, goes through oh, HR. Yeah, and we do the same when we hire an employee that we have. We hire, we do a background check for any employee. Where's that, where's that in the budget? It actually is part of the HR, or um, it might even get charged to the department hiring. It's like a $40 fee, like you said. Also, I wanted to touch, if I may, on uh, Mr. Galstead's job that he's got to, that, that, that's just, that everybody's thinking well that's a lot of money for I'll tell you what um, I wanted to thank him for the excellent job he does and I know that uh, the prosecuting attorneys are busy all over as in you know Polk County and uh, now Polk County has come up with uh, they've they shut down a wing of their prison jail no, but I want to know what, what we're doing, what uh, you're doing with the bad guys, if you can't put them in jail. You know, what's going on there? 
Actually, there's just been some staffing issues. So there, uh, right now, we're just beginning to deal with those issues. We haven't really had any discussions regarding it. I do know that, uh, for instance, I was looking for uh, one of my um, defendants today, and he was no longer in the jail. And I tried to figure out where he was, and they um, have him up in Pennington County right now. So they're that. they're they're kind of switching around and and utilizing other other ut uh, facilities. So hopefully it won't last that long. But it's basically a staffing issue at this point. Well, I want you to keep the bad guys in there. Keep, <laughs> keep it up. Thank you, you know, for your compliments. Keep our city safe. Uh, I'm going to join Brian and ask us to move on with the 16. Uh, move forward. I think we can. Uh, live with that and hopefully she can live with that and get a, someone in, employed. Um, Why don't we bring both of those job descriptions to a vote and we can vote on it before the meeting. You can do whatever you want, Mr. Demers. Well, I'm just asking. But you. I can tell you I'll be voting for the 16. You want to do it now? So, can. can't. Do it <laughs> Mayor. I'll, I'll join in and, and say I support the 16. You know, we've um, we've freed up Reed Hutton in, in our Parks Department to take off and go coming ramping up out of COVID and getting back to good activities for our community and, and we see the benefit of that in all of our programs that have taken off. Let's let our library do the same thing. Let's bring in the people we need and, and start to climb back out of it. I'll support the 16 also. Mr. Adams. That was going to be my remark also. I'd support the 16. I think Charlotte would, uh, I think she can work with that and uh, I think we can keep a uh, very aggressive and uh, library moving and, and, and give the service to the people that they expect there. Anybody else have anything? Anybody else have any questions on the budget? If I can continue. Go ahead. Do you want to let Mr. Demers <coughs> finish with his ahead, stuff? And then something. Mr. Mine's just very quick. I see in okay. there the $4,000 for the street light. Is that stoplights or is that actual street lights? No, the LED lights that we've been replacing, now they're given to an age where some of them probably just need some little bit of repairs. And um, so like in 2019, we spent $200 on those repairs. Last year, we didn't, um, we didn't budget anything for 2021 because we didn't know about it. So now we're budgeting with a good estimate from... Um, the water and light linemen who actually changed them out that please put 4,000 in to replace lights that burn out. So the water the water and light department takes care of that, but it comes out of... Yeah, because the, the street lights are city property. Okay. So That's there are expense. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, have we moved anywhere f further on the infill building? Sale. No, we're waiting for coke. Yeah. Or listing, I guess. I'm trying to figure what page you're on. He wanted to know what page. Oh, 27. 27. <clears throat> Not yet. Could you turn the mic on? Try again. <laughs> No, we've been waiting for the to get through COVID so that we would have a proper price established. But do we, we think have we like do, all of our background? We've done the the appraisal would have to be current, Mr. Demers. So with the appraisal will be done as we come out of here. But we have, I guess, where I'm going. At, do we have the agreements in place with our neighbors and all those type of things that would allow for us? to move forward once we get an estimate or a I know of no impediment David do you yeah as far as like the any um, any common area or anything like that yeah that that has been addressed and when we are we're able so once yep. I think you know we're still s subsidizing that building you know to seven or eight thousand dollars still a year um, be nice to get that off our books as well I don't know is that consider is that something that we should anticipate moving forward in 2022 or are we yes we hold should, off I would expect that we would move forward next year I would also point out as I recall the apparent the paper loss is because of the um, yes. depreciation. Mm -hmm. okay 
so that the we actually cover our costs with the rents that we receive. Okay. And transit, we're maybe fifty thousand to the good for a conservative estimate <coughs> on that. Transit includes the bus purchase, which we know we won't get next year, so that's about seventeen thousand. Um, we also have our dollars that haven't been accounted for, we haven't written a grant for. I have to work with MnDOT to see if we can use those funds for local share of some things. If we can do that, that would reduce. However, with Minnesota having the surplus and with the Build Back Better dollars, they haven't figured out yet to what tune they're going to uh, adjust the contracts or if they will or where that money will go. But I can guarantee you that um, the uh, small urbans and our tra uh, transportation alliance will be pushing for uh, a better uh, local match. Um, right now, our small rurals and our rurals are at 100%. The state's paying 100%. So I would like to think that maybe small urbans would get, instead of an 80 20 split, that we could see a 90-10, which they did in 2019. And then uh, with our COVID dollars, I took care of all of the local match. So again, I, I push pretty hard for that contract to be done. Um, I never want to say that it'll be changed um, because I don't want to be put on the hook for that. But every year that we do have surplus dollars or we have those funds available, they usually do change our contracts and go uh, with a 10%. Uh, 90 10 or I've seen some at 95 5 um, a lot of things change so I would say I wouldn't bank on a, our local match being 110 I would say at least half okay. um, if not zero depending upon how I can spend my funds right and then while I have you the one question about the building inspections I don't think this is just because mr. Peabody asked for more but uh, it goes up by 35,000 yeah we were we were looking to add rental inspections again back into the program we know we need to um, currently Ron and I are working on a new rental ordinance um, obviously revenue uh, as to how those inspections will cost how we get back into that um, will be something that we're still working on whether or not we're going to add the property management code um, we got an estimate from um, uh, in depth of 35,000 to do a f like a fourth of our totals. So it'd be on a four-year basis. Um, so it'd be on a four-year basis. Um, we're still uh, discussing, um, you know, again, what the revenue would be, what we would be charging per unit, or how we would be charging. Um, so is so that 35,000 that covers the? That would cover a year of of contract. Do yes. we? We're not there yet, so I'm I'm foreseeing it not being thirty five thousand for next year. So do we know or we obviously we should know what's the contract that we have with M depth? How long is it? Are we is it one year or renewable or is it multi year or it's it it's renewed every year provided that we don't request changes, which I think they get um they charge us for their time, which we reduce to nothing in the office. So they're not in the office. They're working solely out of um, their in-depth office. So those hours are, are gone. Um, and then they get paid a certain portion of the permits and the plan review. So um, that has, um, that's probably dropped by a third, I would say. Um, it just would be a good idea maybe to go, and, maybe we've been with them for, seven eight years now maybe just get some additional quotes or I, if there's I, anybody I, else out there I, yeah i i guess i i can i can address that um and then i'll just for the, the i'll start with the apartment inspections um you know that's something that we are are looking at this that would be in addition to the building inspections this is something that um I don't believe we're going to be able to put off a whole lot longer. It's it's um, it's a definitely protect the the city as far as um, I know. With, we've worked with the fire department um, on that was so the, for the code inspections and that it's um, I, I think we're it's sooner rather than later we're going to have to adopt that to to protect ourselves. So I guess with that being said, um, the 
you know, in addition to the building inspections portion of it, I, I, I don't disagree for going out and looking at and getting some other quotes or, or somebody that could do that. Um, I will say uh, when we're looking for the apartment inspections and just what I know with talking with my colleagues over there, um, there's really two ways to go. Either you have an in-house building inspector, um, which we just do not have the volume to justify, it, or you contract with a um, building inspection company and building inspection companies are disappearing. Um, few, there's fewer of them that are in the in the position um, for a host of reasons and if you look at everybody is hiring a building inspector for, as far as the, the companies and the cities that have it. There, Everybody's looking for them. Um, so I would ag agree. I mean we certainly can but I guess I, my, I would say we will do what we can to look at it but I don't anticipate us really finding anybody else. Well I mean yeah. at some point like 90,000 is what we're looking at budgeting right now. At what point does it become more feasible? I mean, what kind of going back to this whole it, grade it, scale? Like, is it is that going to end up being something that we'd want to put on? Well, we did start, and we've advertised no less than three times for a full time building inspector, and nobody wants to do it. Which is why we went with contracted position because they're doing it in a number of different cities, whereas we just weren't getting the applicants for a full time building inspector. What we are seeing that I don't think we're far away from is a lot of building inspections offices are combining with the fire departments because the majority of the building inspections um, have a lot to do with fire marshals. They have a lot to do with fire code. Um, they're already doing uh, commercial inspections. They're already doing daycare inspections. They're already doing, they have to be a part of the rental inspections. So we're starting to see those departments being morphed into, um, you know, building a fire department having a full-time building inspector slash fire inspector that handles some of the fire marshal and and things like that. Well, and that's that's so, maybe so a good that question for the chief too is going forward is you know at that point I mean at a, a level sixteen assistant chief is you know around eighty five to ninety thousand dollars a year. That's just wages. You know, you tack on another fifteen probably with wages and benefits. But at some point, is there a benefit to having maybe maybe how we've been doing it? You know. There's probably more people that would be interested in a fire marshal position than maybe a building inspector. You know, I don't know. So when I started looking at our budget proposal for 2022, because of the rental inspection, the importance of that, I put in for a position. And I built a job description that was pointed at 18, grade 18. And that's just a building inspector? Would it, or is that would have been a deputy fire chief. And I looked at the times, I don't have them with me, um, but like 40% of that time would be codes and inspections. Um, I don't have those times, I can't quote them specifically, but I had it broke down. And then we got the, the uh, quote from in-depth and that kind of, we decided not to go with that. Right. I think it was like a savings of $70,000. Yeah. Right, but I guess, <clears throat> To me, like four once every four years is probably pushing it as well. You know, it is. It I is. I mean, we sh it should probably. I mean, and this this is the reason why we have these budget discussions, and it's important because as a city, we should have what our priorities is. You know, and I don't. I mean, to me, like like Mr. Murphy said, like if we aren't doing these inspections. We're face not only is the city like facing some liability, like we're just not doing our residents a service, right? And I think just thinking about how we do this, I wish this would have come to us in October, so, you know, a little bit, you know, so we could really like mold over this a little bit. But I mean, to me, I I think that's a good a better model, maybe is you know in a couple because like i said if we're only going to get for ninety thousand, what's it going to cost us to do a one-year cycle it's probably going to cost us one hundred fifty thousand. you know what i mean like so and not that the that person can do every rental in that 40 percent time either but i don't i mean i would bet that we could get a more efficient to, to do it once every four. yeah to do it more than every four years that would require 
our cons our contracted staff to have to hire another person. So we would be, you know, I mean, there there are other people that they would have to hire, which obviously would make the contract, um, you know, go up. Um, and we did look at that, and I believe we did. Did we end up bringing it to a work session, or was yeah, it I just? I thought we did, but I was. I say, thought we did in I, September. I so. But I, but going or back, August. But going back to, and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Nancy. But the, the every four years, that's the recommended timeline for that. We we didn't just pull that number out. That's the the recommended cycle for it was every four years. In Grand Forks, our apartments are inspected every five years, and sometimes there's some slippage there. Um, and when we say it's a four-year cycle. You don't hit them all on year one and then take three years off. You'll end up with a rotation. And that's also a courtesy to landlords because it's a big deal. You know, if you have a 32-plex that's inspected and they punch, you know, create a punch list of some GFIs here and some this and some that, um, it's a big, big undertaking to bring it back to what it should be. And you hope that the next group of properties maybe gets it the next year and then the year after that, just to create that proper rotation of, of doing the, the corrections that are recommended. So I think four years is a great, a great interval. In, in Grand Forks, it's five. Well, in Grand Forks, sometimes it's 30. And yeah, sometimes we've had some that were seven or eight. But there, I think that was a, maybe a COVID thing, too, because they're getting a little more stringent and, and more organized on that cycle, which, you know, we give them a little trouble for it, but really it is to the point that someone made, this is for the tenants. I mean, it's a, sure enough, the city may have some liability, but if you have a, a property with multi-families in it and somebody's doing something very unsafe, you know, whether they're storing propane in there or stringing power cords or, you know, pulling too much current off of this or that, um, this is for the, the adjacent tenants and all the other families that live in there. And so I feel good about it. I think we should bring it back, and I think four is, is good. Well, and the chief would probably say the best way to put out a fire is before it ever happens. You know, and I think as a, we should be as aggressive as we can um, to make sure that happens, you know. Absolutely. When, when we started, when I started looking at that, that was the priority somehow get it so that our apartments were inspected on a four-year cycle. Now, being selfish, yeah, I'd like to see that in the fire department. Absolutely, and I think we could, it would benefit our community in many ways when we started looking at that position. Um, but looking at the dollar amount, it just, that's... Just seem more feasible. To and more I think, feasible. and I, I'm fine. I guess, like I said, I'm glad we're having the discussion. I think we should... I'm fine with going ahead with the 90,000, you know, the increase to, to add the, the, the other properties. With the key thing in mind is that it's definitely something we should put a pin in and track over the next three to five years, knowing that maybe the goal in five years is to add that position, you know, because I can't imagine as we grow and as you know those contracts are at some point there's going to be a tipping point where it's going to be more feasible to have it in house and i we just have it on our radar and keep it if i may add just to that position of deputy fire chief the numbers i had were 60 percent of that time would be used for uh, apartment inspections and fire code and 30 percent training and 10 percent administrative so was there a savings then because you could do training in-house? No, Somewhere what it would do, what it would do is it would free up our assistant chiefs now that do the training to be a second person with that inspector going into apartments. Yeah, you can't, you, right. you have to send two. Right. You yeah. can't just send one. So, so it would free up the staff putting it there. And also it would be more, uh, there would be more continuity in our training, having one person there to be able to do it. Thank you for the discussion. Thank um, you. I think, I guess in my final thoughts, just looking at kind of some of the items, you know, with with the bus kind of at that 50,000 maybe plus savings, the savings that came out on Friday or today, I guess, um, potentially some savings in <coughs> library position, um, I think, I mean, the way I have it penciled out, I mean, we're probably less than, probably around 375000 um, kind of when you pencil that all in. Um, 
kind of off budget budgeting. Um, to me, three hundred seventy-five thousand. I'm going to say that there's probably going to be some savings or some. We're going to be even higher than that on our revenues or less than that our expenditures, based on past trends. Um, I'm fine with that number. Um, I, I think it's going to come in. We're going to probably. I bet, it w or not bet. That's not a good. I would. I'm predicting that we'll be under two hundred thousand of def deficit deficit spending for for 2022, and I'm fine with going ahead with a budget that that's that. I mean, first of all, that that doesn't even that wouldn't put us below the 50 percent threshold even. So I mean, technically, we could we should if we're going to stay with our same policy, we should probably be. More aggressive with our cutting, but why did you save your happy thought for the end? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go against character. <laughs> anybody else have any questions on the budget or for Carla? I see none. So I just want to make sure I'm correct. I'll I will upgrade the budget with the grade 16 and get that out to you, and we'll vote on it on Tuesday. Correct. That's what I took. Yep. Thank you. All right. Number four, re discussion on redistricting and review of ward map options. What else? Um, just to review, we do our ward maps every 10 years based on what uh, information we get from the census. Uh, based on our charter, we want to make each ward um, as even as possible or as equal as possible in population. Uh, and then the final uh, information is is that uh, we base our ward maps on census blocks and the census gives us those. They are defined by either streets and or water uh, physical features. And so what I do every time I get the information from the census is we take our total population, we fill in those populations in each ward and that was the first map that you had. Um, and it shows uh, the populations for each ward. I take that total population divided by five. We have five wards. N nothing difficult. Um, it gives you approximately 1,835 people per ward. Uh, so as you can see from the first map, we need to adjust ward um, boundaries. So the north end uh, obviously is gonna grow further south as we move because the majority of our population is in the south end. So as you can see, um, ward 1 has more than 1835, same as Ward 2. So we start adjusting. Um, it was pretty easy to get wards 3, 4, and, and 5 adjusted um, because it's very much a grid pattern, so we had smaller blocks to work with. So um, we did that. I did not provide you with those very small block uh, changes, but what we try to do is we try to keep a, as much as possible um, your ward representation staying in those wards. However, that doesn't always um, come to pass. So what we have done is I have provided you with three different options and three different ward maps. Um, ward two being the one that has the three changes to it. Um, the first uh, option um, did uh, move Clarence out of his ward. Um, <laughs> And part of that is because his block is such a large block, but it fits so well into the contiguous part of a ward because that is also part of our city charter as it states it has to be contiguous. They don't really want it to look snake-like in pattern or look gerrymandered. Um, so so that, was, that was our first option. Um, that was kind of our low-hanging fruit. We did also provide two other options because, um, again, one of our things that we don't want to do is we really do not want to um, pull a, a council member out of their ward if we don't have to. So um, if anybody has any questions, um, I could go into further detail, but I did provide um, the ward um, and the census blocks uh, for the south end so you could see exactly where we we pulled from um, and how we got those different ones so one thing to keep in mind is that some of the blocks are quite large in order to adjust them um, we have to prove to the census that there is some way of providing a physical barrier and we have to submit that after the census mm -hmm. is done so it wouldn't take an effect until after the 2030 census so 
So it's it's kind of a long process. It's very difficult to make those changes, you know, in the next year or two. Um, but um. Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so looking at the picture here, and I understand what you're saying about the uh, the uh, other three words, but um, word two looks to me like word two looks to me like it has the letter I understand what you're saying, but um, I don't. I don't know which one of these would be the. That's what I understand with the other three, but three here though the options is. Uh, It has to. Does it have to be totally equal type thing? I mean, or it, it has to go by census blocks. We can't take a half of a oh, census sorry. block because we don't know how the population <laughs> splits out in that census block. Yeah. So what we get is what we get. So if you look, let's just say, for example, um, the block, in fact, that Clarence lives in, it's 143 people. There's really no way to to divide it somehow and get those numbers unless we you know unless we make that correction to the census and they can figure that out and then it's you know on a house by house basis so we couldn't just split it in half and say well 70 people you know 72 are in this side and 71 are the other because that's that's not definable so we can only move the ward boundaries based on a specific census block we cannot cut those in half um, trying to do it in more of a linear fashion. I mean, w w I've, I've looked, this, looked at this in many, many different ways. Unfortunately, because of the point and because of the populations there, um, we have to have more growth on the point for it to keep, you know, the, you know, either the south, you know, the, the point having two wards and the north end having three wards. It just, population-wise, you know, it, it's just not feasible to just, you know, linearly cut it out. We have looked at numerous different ways. I guess so. if I had my choice, I think uh, looking at it, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking that option three is looking like maybe the simplest one to me. I think that if you if you had to go that route, because. That yeah, way, the, the, that blue, way the blue comes in quite a ways on option two. Yeah, and that, that's why I'm saying that way yeah. it could kind of stay, uh, that, that area that uh, Mr. Vatterson could kind of stay in, in contact basically. <laughs> it, mm -hmm. You know, I, I just think that would be the best in my opinion, but. And for sure, I, I don't think know if we have a, chance, a, a choice of voting on it or what, but yeah. that's what I would recommend or I would say I'd pick option three. You're saying option three where there's actually your ward would be to the south of his ward? Yes. The most Is that the one you're talking about? I just want to make sure we're on the right yes. map you're talking yes. about. Option one of, of redistricting a council person out of their ward which should be avoided if at all possible. Right. So. I think three does look, the geometry looks simplest of the mm. three on three. Although Mr. Vetter might do pretty good, might look pretty good in Ward 2, but I think, <laughs> I, I think that's my hardest one. That's no, why, I, I, why, I think three looks like my hardest one. That's why I'm bringing it up, because you're having citizens that are being in your ward would be to the south, would be our farthest south, where I'm not saying I'm looking to get Clarence out of his ward, I'm saying yeah. that is... Like more the, confusing for a citizen to say, well, I'm in there. If you look at the block 36, well, you would think, well, Clarence is my representative then. Yeah. But no, it's actually Dale Helms. Yeah. yeah. So are you saying that two maybe would be the better one, you think? Is that what you're getting at? Or, I mean, I don't, personally, I'm just, like I said, be nice if we could just square it off. And I know we can't do that, but. 
just make it, it would be so much simpler. But anyway, that's that's all I had. Mr. Riopel, Mr. Johnson, I mean, everybody's got me. I like option two. It takes that group that's way south and puts it back into Clarence's. Mm -hmm. And there would be no way to pull off any bit of that blue in option two and tuck it back in? What blue? What green? green are you talking about? Or the green, yeah. <laughs> he's, a, he's an eye doctor. Right. Uh, right. Hey, it's, it's a blue green. green. Yeah. It's a blue number, green. Put these glasses on and trace You number. know it's a blue green. It's green as green can be. I'm kind of zoomed in on it. You know, I'm not seeing the blue around there. Which? So there would be no way to pull off any of that tip coming down Biglin Road back into the purple. You, but you could, but you'd have to make it up somewhere else, and I think that's where the. The, the issue comes in. So if you so if you would pull out that, like say like that, cut it off like there on that. That's why option three yeah. came into yeah. play. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You'd have to make it up somewhere else, and you know the in. So yeah, either you take that block that that the current council member is in, or you got to try to make up those numbers on the south end there somewhere, because you really shouldn't be crossing that river coming in from the north. So you'd have. Yeah, so that's where option three came in. It was really kind of the work to make up the numbers to make them all even. Yeah, it's it's kind of a kind of a goofy deal. So yeah. Better to have a comment. Well, I'm just looking at like on I'm thinking it's James or maybe it's Merrill Court, probably Merrill Court. But that one block of green and the blue block. And across the cooling thing, like the cooling beat. Yeah, that's that's how the census that's how they did their block. And we actually cut it in half because the 33, um, we, we had provided them a couple of suggestions after the 2010, and this is the one they took because um, the Riverview Lane property was not developed at the time. So um, we provided them suggestions. The census takes what they want, and that's the blocks that we have. That, so so that, that 267 one absolutely will be a request for a change in the next one. But according to um, the census and, and the redistricting, the state, you know, that's yeah. what we're stuck with. Yeah, it doesn't take effect until after the next one. Yep, yep. Because I did look into that. <laughs> so. In 10 years. Yeah, I'm fine. You're looking for the option one, is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> Just for knowledge anyway, what happens, let's say that we were had to pick option one, and uh, let's say, or let's say it's no matter what word you're in, we got changed, and the council member was out of his, dis his ward. Do, do they have the option or to run because he's off-centered, so let's say Dale's, he's what, in two years? Yes. Yeah. Well, this year, no. 2022. This year, 2022. And, he, and Clarence isn't run until 23, it would be 24. So yeah. would he have to automatically go back? Or? We, we did look that up, and okay. we reviewed it in the charter. Ron and I visited about it. How it works is that he would have a couple of different options. He could either, if if we adopt the word now map with option one being that one, um, he could uh, rescind his spot and run in 2022 against Dale. He could stay on until 2024, at which time he would not be able to run for that ward, but then could turn around and run again in 2026. So, or he could run it for the at large. In or he could run for an at large. Yes. So those were the three options. Mayor, sounds like an option to get rid of one of us, Clarence. <laughs> 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 but if they really wanted to get rid of both of us, just move yeah. <laughs> three or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and and that was. I mean, yeah. when you started <laughs> moving around, we wanted to yeah. we wanted to move ward or council members as little as possible based on 
on the blocks. It was easier to work around Dale. Unfortunately, the blocks on the south end were much larger with much more populations. Mm -hmm. So it was harder to kind of meander our way through to make, that. To make up the difference in yes. that you did. Yeah. To, yeah. So, that the, so that they were all even. Yeah. So is that the deal then? We have to decide or make the motion on which option we want? Is that, and then vote on that? Is that what you're looking for? Yep. Or, yeah, mm -hmm. yes, and we do okay. have some time because okay. we cannot adopt our ward map until um, the state does their redistricting and, and then the county, and we, we haven't received any of that yet. Okay. We have to adopt it before uh, March, the end of March. But. So we, we do have some time. I just wanted to present it to you just so you had a chance to look at it. Um, do we it. have any sense from preliminary state maps or county, like, if there would be any change to the... Because now, like, even Ward 2 pretend, is split into two county districts, correct? Yep. No, we have. I have not received anything unless Megan, you have seen anything. No, we we've received nothing. And usually they kind of spring it on us at the end of February. Um, so. Well, I know in 2010 we didn't decide till probably February or March. I th or March probably. I think we approved it um, March 19th. I think it was. So. So it was very close to the end. So we kind of had the maps ready. Right. And that's where we're at again. I mean, if we w were to get a sense of even like representatives or if any of that changed, you know, that might affect our map. I, I doubt it will just because right. of the way our population, you know, because we're growing to the south. Well, so. I guess my opinion, the most contiguous, and if you take all the personalities out of it, option one is like the the best option like I'm not trying like I said I'm not against either of you or anybody but it makes the most sense from a contiguous con continuity and kind of an area where people kind of would make logical decisions or logical like break lines to your point about making it as square and cut off as possible um, obviously that causes some people <laughs> heartache or whatever, um, or having to make decisions based on their thing. Um, it's, you know, I don't want to make a bad decision that is going to affect us going forward either because either person could resign or choose not to go or whatever, and then you'd have a map that all of a sudden might look a little bit crazier, and you're saying, why do we have this map here? without this person here and now we're, I mean, it's a quick cycle, I guess, in the grand scheme of things, 10 years, but, you know, how would this affect, you know, anybody else looking to run as well? You know, I mean, obviously, you should, there's two different ways of thinking of it. It's the seat that you're in and you should, you've ran for that seat and you've represented those people, but that, that's going to change anyway, right? Like the people you represent based on this. The other is is that it's not really that person's seat. It's the city's seat and you represent that area. So like I said, I my first option would be option one, but if we're going to defer to you know, making sure that people are safe, I would say option two is the best. Option three just looks crazy. One of the reasons not to redistrict someone out of office is that from an administrative point, you could take out someone you didn't want on, and that would just be wrong, right? So that's right, you know, they, that happens also, at the state and national level all the time. They're doing maps to try to manipulate outcomes, and we're just not going to we're not going to be part of that. But you're also making a decision about who doesn't get to run as well. Well, anybody from can run. Anybody can run. Right, but if you're, I, what I'm saying is, is if you make it as contiguous and as straightforward as possible process you're not advantaging anyone well but you are disadvantaging someone who who currently holds that seat right but so i guess what if I'm, what would have happened if you know 300 more people would have been you know uh moved in on the east side of bigland you probably would have had a different sh different thing and you would have had i'm just taking it to example like 
all of a sudden you'd have to make some little like peninsula out to grab this one person. At some point, you have to find the the, the happy medium. Yeah, you don't represent that area anymore. And like I said, I'm I'm not saying that that's it would be. I think option one is the best option. Yep. But I'm fine with option two if if that's what we want to do. Anybody else have any input comments? I think we'll. You know, and I did. I did provide you with the census blocks, so it, you know, we we don't have to make a decision even next Tuesday. We can move it into January, you know, and rediscuss it. But you have those blocks and those numbers there, so it you know, there there could be other options um, that you might see that I haven't, and I'm more than uh, <laughs> I'm more than comfortable with you providing those, and we can make those new maps as well. So that's that's why I did provide those south end maps. The north end really just um, it, it, it wasn't too hard to, to to make those changes because of we have such good blocks up there, you know, smaller blocks because the roads are in a grid pattern. This one was just more difficult. And and again, like I said, um, you have the numbers, and we're not in any hurry, so this does give you guys the opportunities to look at it as well, and maybe you can come up with some options that are different. So, And we can bring this back in January, but if you don't have the information now, we're further behind. So, All right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Move on to number five, discussion on recreation facility projects and potential local options sales tax. Mr. <coughs> Reed. Thank you, Mr. President, council members. <clears throat> uh, just, I'll briefly just kind of summarize uh, the community open houses that we've had through the month of September. I included that all in your council packet with uh, some of the feedback and results from surveys we had and then we can talk about sales tax. Um, this, the open houses we had, we had three of them in November. First one on November 9th, a second on November 16th, and the third on November 30th. Uh, participation in those open houses I thought was strong. We, we planned them purposely, the first two at each of the ice arenas on evenings that we knew we had activities happening. Um, so there was a lot of foot traffic already coming through the doors uh, at those arenas on those evenings. I would bet between the couple of evenings, we didn't take a head count, but I would bet we had five or 600 people come through and stop and look at the, the, the blown up pictures, the concept plans that we shared with all of you at the council meeting the last week in September. Uh, the, the general, I think the general sense and feeling at those open houses was positive. People um, were really excited to be able to see the blown up concept plans and get an idea of kind of what we're discussing and, and what's come together from the building committee's work. Uh, there was some really great feedback received, uh, even some really just probably minute design considerations, but some things with parking and access to the buildings that people that use them every single day see that they included uh, that I think will be valuable to us going forward. Um, and and then uh, the third one was here at City Hall. That one uh, expectedly was less attendance. I would bet through that evening, that hour and a half, we probably had eight to 12 people come through, not nearly as many. Uh, the, the nice thing about that one is that the people that did come came specifically for that. They wanted to come and see the plans and to look at them and ask questions and give feedback. So I think it was all valuable. Um, the survey responses, we had a survey monkey that was online. Uh, when people came to the open forums, they got a postcard handed to them that they could take home with them that had the link to the survey. Uh, unfortunately, that did not get nearly the response that I would have hoped it would have. We had 38 total responses to that survey. Um, by comparison, the two surveys we had online in the summer of 2020 in June and in April I think total in those two ballpark we had 650 700 responses so um, we sent it out all the same ways we shared it with people in all the same formats we just for whatever reason didn't get as many people to respond to it so um, what that means for the project, I wouldn't say that that means that people are not excited about it. Again, the general feedback that we had with people coming to the arenas and seeing it, I, the general people that have their kids in these winter programs specifically, because that's the season we're in right now, I think are aware of it and are really excited about the potential for the projects and seem that, for the most part, seem to be really on board with the the way that they're presented and the and the kind of the plans that they they seem to hit the need in the 
in the community for what the arenas want going forward. Um, so it, that I think is great. Uh, that feedback, the sales tax discussion, that piece of it. There was a question in the surveys that asked people a yes or no question if they were in support of a local sales tax increase to pay for a portion of the projects. Um, the first question was if they were in support of a one and a half percent sales tax. Uh, that question, 30, I got to get back to it total of all of the questions 31 of the 38 people that responded said yes they supported a sales tax increase the one and a half percent 28 of the 38 said yes to that and then if, if someone answered no to that question it brought them to a one and a quarter percent sales tax a yes or no if they answered no to one and a quarter it brought them to a one percent sales tax to choose from down the line we started in that order just um, obviously I think the obvious is that the higher sales tax percent rate brings in more revenue over the course of the term that we're looking at. So th those are kind of the, the small sample size results we're looking at with those surveys. Um, the sales tax scenarios in that discussion and how they align with the plans we have, um, we used the sales tax average monthly revenue off of our 1% increase that we had in place when we had the swimming pool project. So that average over the almost three years that the sales tax was in place, that average tax increase or revenue was about $85,000 a month. Um, so that was our baseline for what we did with revenue, $85,000 a month in, in sales tax revenue. Yep. Um, so that was the baseline we used at the 1%. We took that number and multiplied it to get to what we would expect our revenue to be if it was one and a quarter percent and one and a half percent. Uh, in asking Baker Tilly, uh, our financial advisors, to put these scenarios together, they're similar to what they were a couple of years ago when we talked about this topic. Um, we asked for them to look at what the total projected funds collected off of a sales tax would be over a set number of years. Uh, on a 1% uh, in the presentation, this information is here. The table provided is what Baker Tilly provided to us. I don't have pages on mine, Mark. It's kind of what page it's on. On page 116? 60. One, 160 if you're looking at it, the sales tax scenarios. Um, the 1% sales tax increase, we looked at that over a 20-year term, um, recognizing that if it goes longer than 20 years, we could certainly collect for longer statutorily than that, but we're going to start to pay more in interest on a project over a bond at that rate than we would have it, than we would be spending towards actual project construction at a 1%. Um, the other two scenarios, we extended that term out to 30 years. Statutorily, again, if we look at a, at a sales tax increase for projects of this nature, we can institute with voter approval the tax for 30 years or when the project is paid for, the dollar amount that we've set by the ballot question is paid in full. Um, those would be basically the two options. So when you look at this table, just looking at potential funds to be collected so everyone knows how to read it and look at it properly, um, I touched on the term length years, total funds collected. That would be the column. That's the fifth line down. That would be the, the total dollar amount collected on the tax. The, the line below that, total projected interest paid, that's Baker Tilly's projection. If we were going to take a bond out on a $19 or $1.5 million project, how much would go towards interest paid? Uh, and then the, the seventh line, project funds, that's the bolded line. That's the estimate of how many funds would be available for construction on these improvement projects based off of each one of those tax increases. Um, for just for, for your sake, so it's kind of all in one place, I gave a few examples of what some other communities in Minnesota have for current sales tax rates. Those are today's rates. Um, that does not include, some of those communities are uh, pursuing local option sales taxes at this upcoming November 22 election as well. It does not include what their proposed rate increase is. It's what it currently is today. Um, summary just on from the League of Minnesota Cities on other communities in Minnesota that are pursuing this. Uh, in two, at the 2021 legis legislative session, there were 20 Minnesota communities that received approval to vote for a sales tax increase for projects of this nature. Uh, and 
the League of Minnesota Cities has had some correspondence with 12 others this year in addition to my my early correspondence with them that are looking to consider it for this year. So just kind of a sample size of what's happening across Minnesota. Um, we're not alone, I would say, in that, with that, in, in that I think all communities in Minnesota have these similar facility plans or issues that need to be addressed, funding, um, you know, funding resources that need to be found, and 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 that sales tax is a, a way to to find that. So we're not alone in that regard in having this conversation across the state. Um, as far as a direction or recommendation, at this point, I don't have any specific recommendation for you. I'm open to questions and want to hear feedback from all of you on the project that we presented last week in September. Any feedback you've received across the community, um, of course. I want to see the projects happen. I think that the projects are the best foot forward for our community and for the department as a whole uh, to really set these facilities up for the long term. So, um, you know, the rate that gets us the, the closest to that is the one that I, I like, you know, internally in the department. But uh, we need to do what's right, what, what rate fits best with what the community wants to see. And that's kind of where I stand today. Maybe I'll touch. <coughs> Just based on the process, quick, that uh, when we have to have something down to St. Paul, just so everybody knows that, <clears throat> hey, you're not asking us to go, okay, this is what we want, but yeah. we also do have a timeline that we can't say, well, let's keep discussing this next month or the month after that. We don't have that, though. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I, I breezed over it, but the process for, for the next steps for us going forward, if we want to pursue a, a local sales tax for this project, our proposal needs to be delivered to the tax committees at the state legislature, House, and Senate by January 31st, 2022. So in six weeks. That's really the time frame we have to make a determination. Um, in order to do that, we need a resolution of support that tells the legislature what tax rate we're pursuing, what the projects are going to be on the ballot, that we would vote for um, and the term or the dollar amount that we are pursuing within that tax. So whatever whatever dollar amount or, or length of years that we would approve the tax to be collected for should it be approved by our voters. Uh, that process then, there's some other supporting material that I would provide to go along with that. Um, I need to provide a document to the legislature that that shares the regional regional significance of the programs or the pro, the projects we would be doing, um, some economic impact of how it impacts the community, um, and then ultimately we would, we would in some form be invited to to present those plans to the tax committees for approval at this legislative session. With approval, then we would. After approval from the legislative session, it would come back to our city council to approve ballot questions by the end of August 2022 so that it could be on the November general election. So given the timelines that we do have, six weeks, um, Mr. Murphy, I guess, in our timelines for meetings that we have, and we always have the option of having a special meeting too, but given the time for work sessions and stuff, discussions, when... Do you think, I don't have a calendar in front of me, I haven't pulled one up, um, with our next meetings, maybe Megan has that ahead of us, um, when we have to make a decision to make sure that we have a final vote of where we're going to go for a resolution. For Mr. I'm, I see uh, Mr. Larson just pulled up his calendar here. I would think um, if we could have it. I would say, early, just in case there's any questions, any feedback, those kinds of things, if we could, if we could, I would try to say our first uh, city council meeting in January. Just because, you know, I mean, if we'd rather have, I'd hate to have it, say you have to make a decision at that point, and, you know, but yeah, so, so I'd say the first one in January, which is January 4th, and that would give us then the option of, you know, if any, further research would to do the final vote at January 18th if necessary. January 4th, the work session? No, 4th is uh, organizational. Oh, yeah. So. We can do something like that. Yes, yeah, but it's a, I'm not it's a business item. Yeah. Amendments on the fly either. I've done that before. <laughs> we did that last time. 
Are you expecting we'd bring it to a vote before we have it at another work session? Or would we try to discuss it somewhere between now and then and, and have a vote on that day? Well, that's Ooh. what I'm trying to yeah. figure out uh, timeline so we're yep. not. <coughs> No, it can be December, not January. It is December 20th. Yeah, December 20th. Yeah. In between, the, in between Christmas, Christmas and New Year's. So, would you want to bring this back to that work session for further discussion? It's fine with the meeting. <laughs> I, mean, I don't have a problem with that as long because it's something that we need to take care of and make sure we walk through this properly and take care of. It's not something we can just whip together and because with your getting the direction from us, you're going to have to put everything together. You, you just can't go back to the end of that. Well, I already put everything together, print it out. Here. We could have a work session with just that item on it. Take the time we need. Because this one does need some, uh, some, some careful deliberation. It sure does. Because now that we're here, you know, having this in front of us, people are hearing this, you know, one, one and a quarter, one and a half. I mean, we're, we're going to get some feedback here, and I think that's what we need to have from the citizens more. I know you guys have been working very digitally getting that in the past couple of months, but I think it's getting down to a point where we have to make sure that we're doing what's correct, we're doing what is needed, and... It gives you time to make sure you put it together so you're prepared when we go down there and when we go down there, you know, so, Mr. Demers. Thank you, Mr. President. Can you clarify the stuff on the current local sales tax rates in Minnesota? Now it says those are what they are currently, right? And are all of those that are listed looking for local option sales tax? I know Hermantown was down when we were there. Um, which yeah. ones are? So it, those don't reference specifically that they're pursuing a local sales tax. I just cherry-picked communities to get okay. tax rates just so people understand how East Grand Forks compares to other right. communities in Minnesota. I guess um, of I those that are listed that way, the ones that I know that are pursuing sales tax, I don't know what percent each of these are, but Moorhead has approval to vote for a sales tax increase next year. Um, Hermantown has approval to vote for a sales tax increase. I think that's it of the couple that are typed out there. Well, I know when we were down in St. Paul, Hermantown was down there at the same time. Yeah. I know when we passed our resolution, Moorhead had some ungodly crazy, like, $70 million thing or whatever. Aquatic Center and City yeah, Hall improvements. Yeah, they had a giant yeah. deal. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, it would be interesting to see what other local sales option rates are going to be if we can for the next work session to try to figure out what's being asked and then what their current rates are as well if that's something we could we as in you <laughs> yeah i can i can ask and see if i can find that i have the the publication that showed what communities got approval it didn't include their tax rates but i can do a little further digging and, and see i'm if sure we can find they're going to go the through league. this process again as us and because mars is one percent last time yeah um there were 20 last year that received legislative approval, so they, they're on the ballot for next November. Okay. That, that includes Moorhead and Hermantown. They don't need to go through this city council process again this year. They did it a year ago okay. and are set. Reed, if I could also, for the work session coming up, take a look at uh, what's the durable lifespan of the things that we're purchasing? Um, is it 20 years? Is it 30 years? If it's not 30 years, then we shouldn't finance it over 30 years. Yeah. Right, so I would, I'd like to have a sense of, of the breakdown of the project, how much of the asset that we're purchasing has a lifespan into that 30 year range. If we go by the current stuff, all of it. <laughs> <laughs> about turf? Turf won't go 30 years. Well, we've made turf and all that stuff go longer. You put a certain name on it, it might go longer. Yeah. Mr. Larson. Uh, question for you, Reed, on the um, legislative approval process. Um, can you clarify if we say went forward with one and a half percent as as a max, could that end up getting cut back through negotiation or feedback with our lawmakers down to say one percent? Or if we go in with that one and a half, that's what we want to do, and that it's it's that or nothing. 
Um, my feeling on the, that question is that whatever we send at the end of January is what our decision is and we stick with it. Um, the process two years ago, you, if you, you'll recall that, we started at a 2% tax increase and then re, we basically passed a new resolution at 1% and brought a 1% increase to St. Paul. Um, so it's been, I don't know that anyone else has ever attempted to do that. We did, but I wouldn't say that that's the way that they want to see the process work. I think, the, and we would, it wouldn't look good, I think, as a community on our part, going down there and then doing that again. The message when we went was, don't bring 2% back, figure out what you want in the time you have, and come back with a better plan. You know, and that was part of what our process has been from that day forward is that's why we did the community engagement we did. That's why we formed the building committee. That's why we put these conceptual plans together, all in an effort to be able to bring a more polished plan back to St. Paul if we went back again. I agree. I think if you come, if we're going to pitch, we better know what our pitch is. Mm -hmm. Mr. Trubetter. Thank you, Mr. President. One of the cities that I'd like to see would be Grand Forks because uh, we're so close. Even with the 1%, we're going to be higher than what Grand Forks is already, but I'm not sure if Grand Forks is looking at a, a sales tax increase. Grand Forks County is. Grand Forks County. Well, they're looking to go homeroom charter or home rural charter, not homeroom, yeah. so that they can, well, it's not the reason why they want to do it, but yeah. it's the reason why they want to do it. The other thing that you're looking, that we're missing in here, is there's no inflation adjustments in any of your figures. So just because we're getting $85,000 a month in the past one, with inflation, by the time you hit your 20 year, you're going to get a lot more than 85000 So you know, I'm going to stick with the 1%. I'm not in favor of one and a quarter, one and a half, because I think with a 1%, if you go 20 years or 30 years, I think you're still going to get enough collected to meet the project bond payments. That's where I'm at. But like, you're with the one percent two with the number all you're really picking is the cap i agree with your your comment about the inflation but all that happens if you say you do a one and a half percent all you're going to do is shorten that term you're going to end up hitting your cap at 15 Sooner. years yes right but at one and a half i don't think our retail sector can swallow that one and a half percent sales tax that's a i mean that's a question to have or whatever but I don't think, like I said, I would just say the inflation problem isn't really about, it's really about the length of the term because you have to set your cap of how long, like, you know what I mean? Like, even at 1%, say you want, at, say you were going to do a $20 million project, if you said that 1%, even though you start gaining more money, you're never going to collect that $20 million because you're going to be, well, you'll collect $20 million, but I'm saying... Of principle, you're never going to collect that 20 million, even though you start inflating that that cost because you've already set your cap at 15. Because you have to set the maximum amount of dollars that you can. Pay. Are you are you not going to set the maximum at what your project cost is? Right, but I'm just saying, like, I guess we're just coming at it from two two different perspectives. Like, I would rather set it. I want a bigger project, and I just think it's going to be paid off quicker than that 30 years because of inflation. And we can have that conversation in the end of the month. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Do you guys want to say no? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> we still got another topic. Yep, we sure do. But it's all good. It's important. I think I have some direction for now. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Thanks. We'll move on to number six. Maybe uh, stall a little bit for the mayor. <laughs> Consider Biglin, Ryode, Reinhardt Drive, roundabout options. Thank you, Mr. President. Good evening, Council. Um, I guess since you know, you, the council, have kind of decided now we're going to move ahead 
pursuing the potential roundabout at Bigland and uh, Reinhardt uh, for our 2023 project. <laughs> Thought it was important, again, that we just kind of bring forward, um, you know, the four options that I think we had previously prevented or presented, which, uh, you know, basically at this point been put together by Alliant Engineering. Um, again, just as a background, Alliant Engineering is the one that uh, had completed the Bigland corridor study, um, recommended the roundabout at that intersection, or recommended as an option. So, again, just wanted to, you know, have some discussion, review the, you know, the, the four options again. So, again, right now, like option uh, 1A, um, again, that option, you know, now when you look at it, would require basically prop potential property acquisition from two different parcels there that are shown basically in the hatching there. You got the one just on the east side of Bigland. And then you got the one kind of on the south side of Bigland and Reiner, kind of, you know, the intersection are just on the south side. You have some potential property acquisition there. Um, this option would provide for basically a full access intersection at Bigland and Fifth there would kind of, um, you know, do some reconfiguration there just to kind of uh, bring Fifth more into a 90 degree um, intersection there. Um, this option, as you can kind of see there, um, access onto Reinhardt from Orton's, you know, would basically be more or less in the current location with kind of an opening in the median there. Um, you know, just see some potential issues with that. You know, larger buses, maybe a, a you know, like a semi leaving Orton's. I think, you know, they can accommodate that. I think their back tires are gonna, you know, track up onto that island. Um, but that, I mean, it is doable. Option 2 a, um, let's see, Rob, I'm sorry, option 1B. Um, that one, again, that one would potentially <clears throat> require property acquisition from three different parcels there. Basically, you'd have the two parcels that we previously discussed, and then <clears throat> what they weren't showing on the drawing, and I kind of highlighted it there, is... Um, the access from Orton's onto Reinhardt would basically get reconfigured, requiring um, some property acquisition there just south of Thornton Station. Um, that option too right now, that one is showing more of a uh, kind of a three-quarter access. You wouldn't be able to from fifth make a left out into Bigland. But again, you know, that one, this option too, you know, you could reconfigure the intersection of Bigland and Fifth to have a full access there. But again, you know, potentially property acquisition from three different parcels. Option 2A, um, <coughs> you know, that one now, at, you know, what's currently shown, that one may not require any property acquisition. However, you know, personally, um, just the way they're showing from Orton's on to Reinhardt, they're kind of just showing a raised, surmountable island, almost like you could drive over that island when to access or to get out of there. But I put a big X no on that one. I don't like that one at all. I, I just I don't think anyone would like that. Um, and then option two B. Um, that one would basically require um, property acquisition from one property there, you know, again, just straight south of Orton's. Um, again, that one right now they're showing at 5th and Bigland, they're showing kind of just that three-quarter access. Again, I see no reason right now why that one couldn't be a full access either. Um, so again, just wanted to have some initial discussion with you, see if you guys have any input as far as, um, you know, maybe one or two of these options. Just again, because we're going to have to start, you know, visiting with uh, 
property owners and such about you know property acquisition that type of stuff so just wanted to bring it forward kind of a little bit of a refresher to where we were kind of at question on on 2b option yep. for the lot that the uh, Orton's access would now go through mm -hmm. has anyone contacted the owner of that lot just willing buyer willing seller to say you know is that lot for sale and at what price you know just a, a casual first contact about that uh, no we have not um, and I guess the reason for that would be is um, it'd be a little bit presumptuous at that point you know if we're looking at this particular uh, configuration then it would be much more appropriate and it, at this point moving forward to, to um, speak to them about that and I guess I can speak a little bit about property acquisition um, yeah, it's always best to, you know if we can work out where it'd be a willing sale for that um, and I did but I did look at uh, that particular property um, it is vacant it has been vacant for you know you know forever it's it's been that way in a long time um, I did look up at what it is uh, assessed for at, in the, the county assessor's office um, so I guess of the scenarios that are presented if we're going to need to acquire property this is probably our best scenario because again it's it's not a residential it's not an occupied residential property mm -hmm. um, you know so it, I guess I would be I would not be very apprehensive about going through the property acquisition process on that particular piece um, and I think it would be a fairly straightforward process um, and I just based on what I've seen it probably would not I would anticipate it was not going to be an overly expensive piece to acquire in the grand scheme of things compared to like say taking mm -hmm. something from an occupied property Question I do have in regards to that also. Um, two parcels are, I'm assuming, are owned by the same person. They are. Making lots. Yep. Uh, my question would be with the, let's say, possible scenario, let's, let's say if we did go this route, with the usage of basically half of that lot to move Orton's entry exit there, would that make the other parcel unbuildable and useless to that owner oh okay that's a very good point very good question i guess what i would say is looking at the the lot that shaded yellow um based on on how that would be is if that if for an access like that you would ha we would have to almost convey to a certain point for it be like a private drive um so you know, rather than say a city street or something where we'd plow that so if we were going to acquire that and we would be working with Hortons and most likely it would be some sort of scenario would be maybe turned over for a private drive that type of thing so with that being said um, most like the best scenario what I would recommend is that we would acquire that go through the process to acquire that entire lot um, because <laughs> then the, the remaining lot on that would really be inaccessible to any kind of public street other than the alley in the back so it, I understand that yeah. parcel I'm talking about the second parcel that's the south of that that one um, what what requirements or things that would be put in place because let's you're gonna have to move the horns access is there gonna be anything that's gonna deter for anything being built on that second parcel that to the south there not that I'm aware of it entryway you would have asked can I put a driveway here this close to his entryway is that we gonna have issues with that um, I'm gonna put Nancy on the spot here do you know would that be a, a requirement or would there be I'm saying is that if this is the scenario that gets <coughs> moves forward mm -hmm. this parcel here would there be any thing that we would prevent that this person building anything on it and having access from this road no. then because it's too close to this entry no okay no. it would come down to their development plans I mean if they had a development in on the books that they were planning to build on that whole thing they'd have to change it of course yeah right. but like I think Mark's right like our access management plan would require some distance and I'm not sure what the access management is on, on uh, Ryan. Uh, That's Ryan I don't have it in front of me. I mean, it's something to look at, obviously. I'd re I would like to know the answer to it because that's going to determine, well, if you're going to do that, 
You might as well buy a second parcel from me because it, it's, you're deeming me not be able to build there anyway. Or you could and share the access. You could you could tee off right as you came on to both par both parcels. You also have you could also share the access with uh, uh, senior citizen center, but we haven't. Uh, you know, Reinhardt, every property that faces Reinhardt has their own access, so we'd be hard pressed to say that you can't have an access. Then to the south of that, you have the access to the senior center. So I mean, you're yep, yep, you're right. But it makes sense, I think, as we move forward, even if there isn't an access, a strong access management plan along Reinhardt, we should probably make sure that we have one as that becomes a more of a corridor. <clears throat> like, I could just see, I, I think Mark's in some ways right, like, coming in and out of a roundabout, you don't want to have three separate entrances that people are coming, you know, trying to in. Ingress yeah. and egress. I'd oh. be in favor of buying both properties if we could acquire them. <laughs> so, but. <clears throat> and then we could look at that. The uh, assessed value, neither one of them are, are very high dollar, high dollar properties. So it depends what the appraisal will come back at. But I, I don't anticipate either one of them being prohibitively expensive to acquire. And, I, and again, we have access management for residential. That's what our access management is. Typically, it's not for commercial properties. So, and the, these are zoned commercial. Yeah. Is that true? I I would assume so. Okay. Yeah, I don't know off the top of my head, but I guess I, I mean, if if Orton's access point would be to that, that would be a commercial property. Oh, yeah. So Gosh. you know. Okay. Mr. Elms, you had something, sir. Yeah, I, I'd just like to have a verification on the vote that was done last week. Uh, I thought the vote was for um, going ahead with the idea of getting an actual cost of this project and not actually doing this project in 23. I thought we were just looking for a cost to get find out I the final we'll, cost of it. We need to make sure what what's we're going to do here so we can move forward. To get that cost, so we need to look at how it's going to be laid out, which option we want. So then, Mr. Emery has the information of know how he can, what the design is, and then so we know if there's property to, to acquire. So okay, because I want to be sure what we're doing here. So when I vote, yes. I know what I'm voting for. And and both projects are still going ahead into the planning stages further. Both of them, tenth and this. Yeah, and I guess if that's agree, so, correct me. I, well, I'll put this out. So if if the council votes uh, and picks kind of an option, then I guess at that point, my the way I would take it then is um, that's a, a, a scenario that was picked out. So it would I would be then authorized, or it would be uh, prudent to start contacting the property owners to start seeing what the willingness for acquisition is. And I would suggest that uh, I would most like I would contact Hortons as well to see what their long term plan is. Have them look at this and see if they have any issues with the access. So and I'd be happy to be part of the <clears throat> conversation with Orton's. We've spoken already and they're okay. eager to know what our plan would be if we were to go because it'll guide their their development even of their site based on how they're going to be able to access it. Okay. Yep. Mr. Demers. Thank you, Mr. President. Is there any um, like requirements for residential access on the legs of a roundabout? And I guess to be more specific, I'm talking about the properties on the east side of it. It appears that there's probably three, maybe four residential access that access right onto Bigland right now. I I would just wonder is the would that be allowed? Are we looking at different property acquisition to try to, you know, force that to the be to the rear access? Um, you know, I I would imagine it's not an easy task right now to back out onto Bigland at certain times of the day. Um, I don't know what what that would look like with the roundabout for those three to four properties. <coughs> Yeah, the, I mean, the biggest, you know, the biggest thing is if, you know, if they wanted to come out of their driveway and go south, you know, they're going to have to basically kind of go, come out, 
go north, almost make like a U-turn there, and then you know head back south or whatever. But well, the and the properties to the north of the roundabout would have to basically make a U-turn on on that island, right? Or just take the roundabout. Well, they wouldn't be able to get to the roundabout. We'll make no. It. no. They'd have to either do that or go all the way around the block the other way. That would be a, a good thing, I guess, maybe to look at the MUTCD or contact the state, on, you know, residential access onto a roundabout. Um, I know that the uh, and forks, the apartments, the apartments do access right into the roundabout, so I know that, that there is some residential, but I don't know if it's dependent on individual residences or not. Well, and they have the advantage of being, coming from a parking lot, right? Correct. So turn yeah, so they can on. turn around. That's that's what right. I'm saying. You know, it, I guess residence defining, it's different for a single residence versus a multifamily. Right. Um, we do currently have access management standards on Bigland. No one will get uh, a private residence access onto Bigland anymore. Um, and that's why we have the alleyways. Um, and that's why a majority of the people do access. Um, but if your garage is facing Bigland. Right. Well, that's, I you, guess my You're, you're asking someone to build a garage then on the back and, you know, access. Right. I mean, because people do like storing their cars in garages. That well, that's, makes I guess perfect my point sense. is, as, so. as we flesh this out, those are real yep. issues yep. for people. So, so, so that, that would be something that you would want to consider. I mean, yep. If that doesn't meet, I could see the, the one south of the roundabout the one, I guess, is yep. that's south of roundabout. That one doesn't seem to be as bad of a deal because really it's just a back out into actually better traffic for them. And then you could go out and spin around a roundabout and you're There's going south. Side the the south side What's it? There's one on each side of the road. Yes. Yep. Yeah, I guess I didn't see that one on this. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess the thought was is... If those aren't going to be feasible, like you have to factor in either a trying to figure out a reconstruction of a garage or whatever to figure out what's the best fit. And, and I think, yeah, I mean, I think in the process, all of these people that are potentially affected by this, you know, maybe not through property acquisition, whatever, but I think we're going to have to, you know, have those discussions with them and how, uh, I, I do know who I, how this project would impact them. I I do uh, I do have a person that in mind and who I will contact and and get their opinion on whether or not they may would have some sort of obje you know legal objection to this or something along. Well, those and lines. like I said, I just I mean, there's about like I forgot about that one on the on the west side. Yep. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's probably four or five properties that would be affected for access. So we should figure out what the try to figure out a mitigation plan of what that could, would cost. So basically we get down to it. Are, are we all looking at option 2B as the most logical? Unless you hit some big obstruction on the acquisition of those lots. Right. Right. Exactly. I would say as long as we can, with that 2B, if we can make that that fifth access, a full, yeah. full access. Full access. Yeah. And if we can yeah. smoothly acquire those two commercial properties. Right. Okay. We well, don't need two, just the one. Why right. Two? Correct. Well, I think the leaning was. But I mean, we're worried about the budget. Everybody's, you know, trying to save money. That's where now, now we're out here. We don't want to buy two. The only reason one it would be two one. is if the seller says one is okay. worthless to us. That's how it would turn into two. Right. Well, also, I don't think we should. We should go to closed session if we want to start talking about strategy. Because, but I do think an initial <laughs> contact we could be costing <laughs> ourselves a lot of money by having this. Yep. Kind of, this kind we're, of we're basically yeah. authorizing our city administrator yeah. to start that conversation. Yep. Yep. Anything else, Mr. Emery? No, that's the direction we needed tonight. Thank you. Okay, and I think I have mine as well. So, intend a motion to adjourn. I'll move. Move by Johnson. Second by Larson. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion is carried, means adjourned. See, so when.